Hello and welcome to the session. In today's session, we will be discussing about the program, uh, the course in fact, the subject MCS12, Computer Organization and Assembly Language Programming. And I'll try to give you a brief roundup of this particular program. We have covered nine sessions on this particular, uh, in fact, uh, not the program, but the course. We have covered nine sessions on this particular course. However, let us put all the information about this particular course into one uh, place. So I, I just want to discuss with you how exactly this course is, what are the various uh, components of the course, and how you can go about doing this particular course. Uh, there are nine sessions, as I told you, which are already there about this particular program, uh, this particular subject, and those are uh, on different topics, include, I mean, starting from basic computer to uh, we are moving to, to the central processing unit and uh, assembly language programming. So what does this program cover and why it is so important for you to uh, do this particular uh, course? Well, uh, if I look at uh, the, con the construction of this particular uh, subject, what you see, there are, the, we start with uh, computer, basic computer organization, right? And go on to discuss about the number representation. Right? And uh, thereafter, combinational circuit and sequential circuits. Now, this in itself is a course in many uh, universe at BTEC level or at different levels, right? Which is with the help of a digital design, this kind of a course is taught, where the logic circuits and uh, logic as well as uh, flip flop and all, all those uh, combinational and sequential circuits are taught, right? So, uh, this in itself is a, a course at some certain places which tries to teach logic. Here, we are, our objective is not to teach you complete logic, but to make you comfortable with the uh, circuit designing a little bit so that you can appreciate like how those circuits and how those things can be uh, created although we will be dealing with the simple circuits but then in the industry when or suppose you uh, go on to join an industry of that kind then you really need to uh, go through these kinds of courses in detail and learn more about it. However, this is the good starting point for you the whatever we have covered in this particular course is a good starting point. Then we have talked about the memory organization and input-output organization. Well, these are uh, the essential requirement of any computer system. The memory requirement basically if I uh, take you to computer organization course, like computer organization always talks about, uh, in fact computer organization and architecture always talk about the instruction sets, right? So uh, somewhere down the line when you are dealing with the instruction set, somewhere before you go to the instruction set, what you need to know various components and how they interact and what are the important of importance of different components, how these technologies work, right? So these are the uh, discussion as far as uh, we have done in this particular course. So basically you can uh, cover some components as well as uh, the organizational component in this particular course. And then we go on to discuss about the, uh, the central processing unit where uh, the micro instructions etc were talked about in, in detail and finally there is a uh, there is a unit on I mean there are uh, pro construct on the assembly language programming in addition we have many more things so let us uh, discuss each of these blocks uh, each of these blocks in more detail so that you can appreciate what exactly we have done in this particular course so you can imagine that this course uh, gives you tremendous confidence as well as this course talks about the internals so the course which talks about the internals will definitely help you in programming, it will definitely help you in understanding concepts of operating system and it will definitely help you in designing low level software specifically if you are interested in designing uh, compilers or uh, those kind of uh, compiler writing or other kinds of things where low level programming is essential. So this, this is the course which is going to give you tremendous confidence. Some of you may uh, go on to do, I mean later on go on to do some hardware description also, so hard, hardware description language languages, once again the starting point is the logic gates etc only, right? So you know all those things and you can utilize uh, all those things in this, uh, whatever you learn from this particular course. Now if we look into block 1, uh, the unit 1 and 2 basically focus on some uh, aspects like von Neumann architecture. Now this being the first architecture, 
and still very, very one of the popular architecture, although uh, there are many newer arch architectures have come, in, come into existence. So it is uh, the, the, in fact, architecture which basically defines what computer units consist of. And all of you know what computer consists of these, I mean, the central processing unit, the input output and the memory, right? So basically these are the components, but not just these components, but how they are connected, interconnected with each other. And that is the main hallmark. Today, uh, you might be having very, very advanced systems where uh, multiple connection paths are there between the CPU, and the memory and the input output uh, units. But once again, all these paths are going to be very expensive. Circuit boards are going to be expensive. So von Neumann architecture was the first one, right? Where the problem is once again, von Neumann architecture suffer from the bottleneck and the bottleneck is single path. <laughs> that is the single bus uh, which was available in the von Neumann architecture. So I think you, you got to go into these details. You got to learn about these details. Then in this, uh, we have talked about instruction execution, like how these units can come together to execute a particular uh, uh, instruction, an instruction, which is just a mnemonic. So in, in order to understand the instruction, uh, uh, this this thing uh, may be just a starting point at this point of time, but unit uh, block three talks about instructions in a much, much more elaborate manner. And block four gives you a very good example of instruction set, how an instruction set can look like. Okay. Then uh, this unit, uh, I mean this uh, unit one and two also discuss the concept of interrupts. Now that is uh, something very useful for every one of you to know. Uh, all the input output processing which you do from the keyboard, and you know the keyboard is one of the slowest device, right? So keyboard input output is with the help of interrupt. When you are dealing with the hard, hard disk, interrupts are involved, although it is using direct memory access, but interrupts are only uh, always involved. So the interrupt is something like uh, what we can simply assume that uh, somebody, uh, I'm taking the lecture and somebody interrupts, okay, by asking, raising hand and asking question. So that's a typical interrupt. So how the interrupts are going to be handled? Now, typically, if uh, uh, you ask a question to a particular teacher, teacher will not stop immediately, right? Teacher will stop at a point where he or she has finished a particular concept and then he may come to you about your question. So that is how the interrupts are serviced in uh, CPU, by the CPU. CPU waits till the ongoing instruction is completed and then the interrupts are acknowledged. And then, then there can be a priority of interrupts also, which one will be acknowledged first, which will be acknowledged later. For example, I mean, why priority is needed is suppose a keyboard uh, interrupt is being processed and there is suddenly a hard disk interrupt which occur at the same time. Then hard disk interrupt is going to be uh, acknowledged immediately and keyboard interrupt can wait. For the simple reason, because uh, the hard disk interrupt, if it is not acknowledged immediately, then probably there will be a complete complete rotation, rotational delay. And if there is a rotational delay, you know uh, it may be in, the, in terms of milliseconds. So that is why the priority of interrupts also become very, very important. And uh, uh, there is a discussion on uh, priority of in, on interrupts. In addition, there are simple concepts like family of computer, then the risk, uh, that is a very large scale integration technologies. These are the things which has been discussed in these units. They, they are very good to know. Like uh, today we are dealing with ultra large scale integration oriented technologies. Although if you know, you don't know VLSI, then how you are going to understand the ULSI and all those kinds of technologies in a sense. But it is basically packing more and more uh, logic into, I mean, it's gates but then ultimately it is the logic, right? So it is the semiconductor technology which you are putting in, but ultimately you can pack more logic, you can pack more information, you can pack more memory within the CPU, you can build in more processor within the CPU. So all those things then uh, fall uh, from this particular information only. And the concept of family is one of the most important concept which was uh, brought in by uh, IBM. I mean, you learn from history, you remember that, okay? So this is a typical concept about the family, it, where you learn a lot about how families, uh, uh, impo I mean, uh, hierarchical things were uh, transferred from various versions of families. Just like 8086, 
uh, to, uh, I mean, it, it, it x86 processor kind of things, where once again we are uh, having the similar instruction set. So we have the similar kind of input output devices being used, right? So a uh, lot many, lot many good things uh, are there as far as family. So you inherit a lot of good things from family. And uh, over a period of time, you, uh, I mean, uh, you pack so many things that uh, sometimes it becomes difficult to leave the bad things apart. So that also is a slight drawback, uh, but uh, that is where you will find that newer architecture also have come into existence. And one of that architecture happens to be the reduced instruction set computer architecture, which uh, we might like to define a little bit uh, later, but it has been discussed in uh, one of the blocks of this particular course. Then uh, there is a simple discussion about uh, the fixed point, floating point arithmetic. Now what you need to understand is fixed point is very, very important, but then uh, fixed point arithmetic represents a number range. For example, with 8-bit uh, two's complement uh, notation, you can represent minus 128 to plus 127. And if you use 16-bit representation, okay, you will find the, uh, the C programming, in C programming the range is given from minus 3 to, 3 to 7. 7682 plus 32768. So you just uh, find out what is 2 to the power 15 and plus 1 value and you will be able to relate. So minus 128 to plus 127 using the similar logic you can find out how the how various uh, sizes of fixed point numbers are determined. So you should be able to know how various programming languages support those kinds of representation. Similarly your ASCII, your UTF-8, UTF-16, all these coding terminology which you use uh, in most of the uh, data transmission stuff including from, uh, when you are transmitting data from from your device, uh, like from your even input output device to the memory uh, or to the computer, it is passed on as ASCII or uh, UTF-8 or UTF-16 kind of a code. So that is another uh, concept which you learn in this particular uh, unit. And finally, there is a concept of error detection and other codes, which is a very important component to understand because error detection is uh, something which all of us should learn how, how we can do uh, error detection. Error detection is fine, the parity bit is fine. Okay, uh, when, when, when do you, I mean, what is the importance of uh, error detection and correction? Error detection is primarily when we transfer data from one source, a particular source to a particular destination, right? So during the data transmission, if there is an error, right? That is what is to be determined through error detection code. And uh, in general, compu in computer, one bit errors are detected. And if you want more bit errors to be detected, then there are complex codes. Okay, then uh, block, wherever block level transmissions are there, then there are block level uh, uh, detection codes. You will find in the hard disk configuration and so on and so forth. But for determining one bit error, you have parity bit. And uh, for uh, uh, finding the error also, like uh, which bit is in error, you then use the, uh, the Hemings error connection code. And then there is a double error detection code which can be uh, done, that if the, which basically checks if there is an error in the two bits. So this is what we have covered in unit one and unit two. Unit three and unit four basically focus on gates and logic circuits. Uh, unit three is primarily gates and logic circuits, the combinational and sequential circuits. And uh, the sequential circuits are discussed in unit four, then design of combinational circuits and examples of co combinational circuits. So uh, this is where we have uh, discussed about the Karnaus map and uh, you should be uh, uh, comfortable with using uh, K-map by now because uh, it's a very good visual representation of uh, your truth table and it is that is where you are able to uh, find the adjacency and eliminate uh, that adjacency. It, like uh, what you should be sure of that each box in the Karnau map is representing a min term. So by combining, you are combining several min terms together and producing an optimal solution. So that is how uh, Karnau's map work in general and it is a very useful tool for designing good circuits. All right. But the, 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 there is a limit to visual representation. So Karnau's map can be used only up to uh, when we have up to six uh, variables only. And beyond that, then we have to go in for different kinds of uh, methods. Uh, and one of the methods has been just introduced uh, 
which uh, may, you may go through and it is uh, there and over there. Then uh, some of the combinational circuits like adders, decoders, multiplexer, read-only memory. Now these are some of the circuits. Adders we have discussed to a great extent when we were dealing with, the, uh, with the, our sessions. Then uh, decoder is primarily used uh, when you are dealing with the decoder. It is basically selection lines are basically decoded lines only. So that is how you, I mean, you, you should be using uh, the decoder to a great extent. Multiplexer is one of the important one uh, and you, you use it for register transfer and other uh, shifting and all those kinds of things. So multiplexer, uh, I mean, uh, multiplexer in any case is one of the most important uh, device. I mean, you multiplex basically uh, from several inputs. Uh, there are multiple inputs and they are sharing one particular line. So how uh, exactly uh, which line will be transmitting onto that particular output line. So multiplexer is one of going to be one of the major uh, device when you are constructing CPUs, when you are constructing exchanges, exchanges of telephone or whatever, right? Because wherever sharing is there and multi -people, multiple people are sharing uh, uh, less number of lines, you require multiplexer, right? Uh, then read-only memory is uh, one of the major uh, stuff where, which is, it is a combinational circuit because read-only memory is fabricated, right? Uh, whereas uh, the read-write uh, read memory which you have that is ROM, ROM is a, a sequential circuit because storage is there and then the changing of the value is required. However, in read-only memory, it is a simple combinational circuit and whatever you want to store, you can store. Uh, in the output and just the line, you decode the line and that's how the re read-only memory can work. It can be utilized, re ROM can be utilized uh, for uh, sometimes a similar kind of ROMs can be used for uh, fabricating your control units also. Right? Then we have flip-flop, which is a very important concept, like uh, it is the storage unit and uh, there are sequential circuits like registers or shift registers, which uh, are utilized by uh, various uh, places. Uh, I mean, uh, these are the things you will you learn. There are multiple uh, uh, programming, uh, multiple instructions, which you use shifting and all that. And the counter circuit, which basically count the sequence. Then uh, block two primarily focuses on the memory hierarchy, which I think we dealt with in a great detail in our session where we discussed about the cache, RAM, ROM. Uh, ROM, uh, we uh, not discussed that much, but DRAM, flash memory, all this information is available. Then we talked about a little bit of secondary storage technology and their characteristics. Then a very important uh, device these days, I mean, this is the storage uh, configuration, which is called uh, redundant area of independent disk, RAID, and its level. So they, it is organized into various levels. So what you have is a number of uh, uh, a uh, number of uh, redundant arrays, I mean, the number of disks, and how uh, those disks, how those disks can be used to store information redundantly. You see, whenever whenever you want uh, uh, the, the in enhancement, I mean, you, you want the enhancement of uh, uh, fast input output, okay, then you have to use redundant arrays or those kinds. But then in the redundant array, if you are getting fast input output, the advantage is fast input output as well as the uh, that reliability of the storage system. Because why? Because reliability in the sense that there are two locations where data is stored. So even if one disk goes bad, you have the other disk available. But how that reliability is going to be built in, right? So that is one of the piece of uh, information. And then what way, whether we can take uh, simultaneous input output from those uh, arrays, right? Array of disks. So that, fab that forms the basis of RAID architecture. So it is a very good architecture, su supports, uh, I mean, it's a very reliable architecture and uh, uh, wherever the servers and all uh, server farms are used, the uh, data centers, they all use uh, somewhere down the line storage area networks or SAN, which basically uh, RAID and all those things are utilized in those technologies. Then we have the memory system of microcomputer. So the uh, microcomputer, we have uh, typically the memory hierarchy, which includes the cache, 
which includes several level of cache nowadays, L1, L2, then we have the main memory, then we have the secondary memory and so on and so forth. Then uh, input-output interfaces, which uh, basically serial parallel communication interfaces which you have, then you have the, these days you have many more interfaces available to video output, then HDMI, so those kinds of technologies are there. All those, all those uh, may not be discussed in uh, the blog, but you can always uh, uh, refer to the uh, material, uh, I mean, uh, take the help of internet and uh, refer to internet based material for input output interfaces. Uh, the input output interfaces, why they are very, very important because input, uh, input output interfaces communicates with the device on the one side and they also communicate with the, uh, with the CPU on the other or the system bus like. So that is where they become very, very important. Why? Because the devices are very, very slow. So it is the input-output uh, interface which has to control the 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 uh, the input uh, the uh, the level out the difference between the technology. So they are very important in that sense. And uh, device controllers, once uh, device controllers primarily are input-output interfaces which has been implemented. So they, they are useful in uh, SCSI and uh, those uh, SCSI and uh, IDE, etc. what you hear, they all are important stuff. Although on those interfaces you don't have to do much, but you should know what exactly those technologies are and why they are utilized. Then we have input output techniques and most of you are familiar with, uh, we have dealt with the, the interrupt driven input IO and program driven input output. Then we have DMA and input output processor and then interrupt processing like how interrupts are processed. So these are uh, the concepts which has been discussed in uh, quite a details as far as uh, unit 1 and unit 2 are concerned. Then unit 3 and 4 uh, basically talks about the hard drive. They are primarily on the uh, on the disk and uh, I mean the input output technologies rather than anything else. So if you are dealing with the hard, hard disk, what is partitioning, what is formatting, what is uh, FAT, right? Uh, the for, uh, file allocation table, which is a major part as far as uh, uh, the, your uh, DOS based, I mean the Windows based systems are concerned, uh, the, the, how the files are allocated, how those uh, things can be uh, utilized, inodes which are unix, used in Unix, FAT16 which is very, very, which used to be very common, now it has been changed. So you can, uh, I mean from there uh, you can, uh, from the starting point you can always move to the latest technology in uh, your own way, right? Then there is a drive speed, access time, rotation speeds which you deal with. Uh, as far as uh, hard disks are concerned, like how drive speed uh, uh, contribute to the access time. Okay, so that is how you have, and then hard disk, hard drive interfaces which you have is SCSI and the ID which I just spoke about. Then removable storage options, you have many removable storage op options, including, uh, I mean, pen drive and uh, CD-ROM, CD, uh, CD uh, DVD and all. And these days there is another very important uh, uh, input output technology which uh, you may be interested in is SSDs, solid state devices technology. The difference between SSD and hard drive, they, they uh, technically share the same logic, but what SSD uh, have an advantage that there are no moving parts. So all the uh, information, it is all through the uh, logical moment and uh, basically the, uh, the, the, I mean it is not the physical moment uh, what you experience in the hard disk. So that is why, I mean, uh, the, 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 the stuff where, where the, uh, the SSDs are much, much faster and uh, good interfaces, so they, they enhance the speed of input output to a great extent, okay, and, uh, the, but they are expensive, right? Just like uh, the memory hierarchy, the basic logic of memory hierarchy was uh, itself that why memory hierarchy is uh, uh, difficult to deal with because, uh, or why do we need, we need a memory hierarchy because it is difficult to, uh, I mean, invest too much in, uh, the, in, in, a simple, in a single kind of memory. Although it, is, it will enhance the speed to a great extent, but it will increase the cost and is it required? So there has to be a trade-off, right? So that trade-off comes in the form of memory hierarchy. So this is one trade-off and the second trade-off is definitely the 
that the storage, uh, permanence of storage and all other technology, uh, the secondary storage technology offer you permanence of storage. SSD offers you uh, between um, RAM and uh, hard disk, somewhere in between kind of uh, storage, uh, uh, storage capacity as well as the speed. So that is a good, good option. In fact, uh, SSD uh, disks, I mean, uh, when, you, when you use, uh, uh, suppose you want to buy a new computer, then it may be a good idea to have some minimal level of, let's say, 256, uh, I mean, uh, GB SSD maybe, or even smaller SSD. And the operating system is on the, onto the SSD, and the rest of the data you have onto your uh, hard disk. Even that is going to enhance your, uh, uh, I mean, your uh, the processing speed, etc., to certain extent, to, to a great extent. So you can think about how exactly you can plan your devices, how exactly you can plan your systems, okay? Then uh, other, other devices which you have, video cards, liquid crystal display, right? So these LCD screens and all that which you use uh, as an input-output device. So uh, this unit talks about it. Modems, print resolution, scanners, keyboards, mouse, how do they work? I mean, it's not just what uh, exactly they are, but how exactly they work, what are the scan codes, <coughs> What is the print resolution? What is the scanner resolution? <coughs> How does modem transmit? So some technical details are there as far as these units are concerned. Uh, block three uh, talks about the important part is the instruction format. Now instruction format, uh, as you know, basically consists of the operation code and uh, addressing modes and the uh, and the address actual address. So the addressing mode and ad actual address play a very very important role when we are designing an instruction set. Okay, so that is what uh, is the whole uh, I mean uh, the aspects of uh, block three. So instruction format. The number of instruction which you choose for in, in a particular instruction set is very, very important. So the type of instructions which you want to get into a particular, which you want to uh, have in an instruction set of a computer, which may be the arithmetic instruction, maybe logical instruction, maybe the, the shift instructions, then the program transfer control, the transfer of control instructions and the special instructions. So these are in general the kind of instructions which you will be requiring in any kind of a computer and all those has been discussed in this. An interesting thing has been talked about here is that how the number of addresses in an instruction, right, uh, affect the size of the program. However, they also affect the size of the instruction. The more are the uh, operand addresses, the Long, longer is going to be an instruction. Now that is where uh, some designer brought in a technology called reduced instructions at computers, where uh, they even if we are utilizing one or two uh, operand in an instruction, even uh, even in that particular case, all the operands are in the. Uh, register. All the operands are register. So register operand, you got to have the uh, smaller length addresses, but. In the cases of some of the, I mean, it's uh, as far as uh, the machine goes, the data has to be stored somewhere in the uh, memory ultimately, right? So those uh, addresses are also very, very important and they are also dealt with in reduced instruction set computers also. Then we have the type of operands over here. So number of uh, the type of operand you already familiar with, which we uh, discussed in the instruction, uh, the, the representation of data, right? So uh, that is uh, where you can uh, once again consolidate the uh, type of operand which you have that is floating point. Uh, if you are dealing with numbers, then floating point, fixed point. If you are dealing with characters, then you have ASCII, UTF-8 and all. And if you are dealing with the logical data, then they can be simple number representation for that also. Then there are addressing modes and their importance, and the addressing modes, as I talked about, uh, the addressing modes uh, many a times makes things easier for you to deal with. Specifically, um, um, one of the most important concept which you use in your program is array, right? Uh, without array, uh, I mean, it, it, is, it becomes somewhat difficult when you are doing the repeated processing, right? So arrays are important and uh, uh, to deal with array, you have uh, typical, 
that is indirect addressing modes which require base address and all uh, base address with uh, incrementation, decrementation that makes the array processing very, very fast. You see, uh, the organization has to go hand in hand with the programming languages. If it doesn't go hand in hand with programming languages, then what you will end up creating a machine which is not optimized for writing different kinds of programs. So that is what is important in this particular case, right? So, so description of, uh, and then uh, you always have registers. So this is what is important when we are dealing with, uh, I mean, uh, instruction sets. And instruction set architecture is, has uh, one of the major role to play in a, uh, I mean, you, you call a machine good or bad based on instruction set architecture to a certain extent. And the objective is, to study what kind of programming environment this is going to be the best kind of a machine. So instruction set designer have lot many uh, major role to deal uh, with and, and that is where I think the Intel designers have done uh, great, I think they have done uh, literally some good work and that is why they are able to produce some wonderful processors and which have been lasting from years to years to years. I mean, so many years it has been there. The uh, Apple designers, I think, now now have uh, moved on to. They, they, there is a convergence of uh, uh, as far as uh, the technologies are concerned. So now we are having uh, similar kind of architecture which are coming up for uh, these machines. But still, their uh, overall instruction sets are somewhat different. Okay. Then uh, the micro operation concept, this is very important that how an instruction is going to be executed within the instruction. So an instruction is a macro instruction for a computer, right? For us, the programming language is a macro instruction, right? From programming language, then we convert to machine language that there are number of instructions which gets generated. And for CPU, even that uh, machine instruction is a macro instruction, right? So that is how the thing goes, right? And that macro instruction requires certain steps of execution where uh, the simple, if you, uh, if you want to see the simple micro operations which, which may be required, some, some will be required for fetching. Now if for fetching, you will be, if, if I want to fetch an instruction, so there will be several steps which will be required. So each of those steps becomes a micro operation for fetch. Then the decode, uh, for decode operation on the instruction will once again require uh, several uh, micro operation and like that. So micro operation are the minutest or the smallest or the simplest kind of examples, uh, the operations which are required for execution of the instruction and those are basically at the level of, I mean simply at the level of transfer of information, uh, doing some arithmetic or uh, logical operation onto the data, transferring data from one place to another so that, I mean it is something very close to how controls unit should be operating that particular computer. So somewhere down the line micro operation leads to design of the control unit. Okay, so this is how the whole sequencing is uh, there as far as uh, design of the machine is concerned. So basically you have the application or orientation, application programming languages, applications which are there. On that particular basis, the machine uh, architecture is designed. And once the machine architecture has been decided, then on that particular, for example, if you are work, uh, trying to work uh, to, uh, to, let's say, uh, work in the area of neural networks and highly parallel processing oriented stuff, okay, weather forecasting and all those uh, kinds of situation. So this von Neumann architecture is of absolutely no use to you. Why? Because the uh, uh, one, uh, the bottleneck of uh, uh, one uh, path, it makes it absolutely redundant. So, and you are dealing with, uh, one instruction is dealing with huge amount of data. So you require a different architecture altogether, right? So from your application, we design the instruction set. Right? In fact, uh, the programming language also can differ. So from programming language, then you define a very typical instruction set, the parallel instruction set or a serial instruction set or reduce instruction uh, computer set. And from there, then you uh, decide the, the micro operations which will be requiring to, uh, which will be required to control the execution of an instruction, maybe the pipelining concept, uh, which we'll be just discussing a little bit later. And uh, then from there, then uh, the final 
finally uh, we move on to the design of the control unit which is the unit which basically provides the control signal that now this operation is to be micro operation is to be performed this micro operation is to be performed so that particular sequence can be preserved with the help of control unit so it is all integrated it's all related and that is why they are coming in this particular sequence only in your block and their unit so uh, organization of arithmetic logic unit i think uh, that is what we have dealt with in the last session uh, so you should be familiar with the alu and how alu micro operations are designed uh, this is a very important uh, stuff in that particular category design of simple uh, units of alu arithmetic logic and shift micro operation as i told we have already designed now the pipelining is a very interesting concept because pipelining uh, can be done for instruction can be done for floating point addition can be done for uh, number crunching problem uh, uh, situation but the one of the most important pipeline deals with the instruction pipeline so instruction pipeline is a interesting concept because instruction can be divided into like uh, it is something like uh, uh, if i uh, i want to perform for example if i want to do railway reservation booking all right now if i want to perform that particular task how the things can be uh, one is that there is one person who is doing the reservation so first person come he does the all the tasks of it right so that is uh, i mean uh, first takes the form of it then uh, then inputs all the data into the computer now at the next level then collects the money then issues the ticket now can we can we design a mechanism now, uh, instead of one person we have three parallel uh, units which performs this particular task right so three uh, simple i mean three workstations which will be performing where one will be just collecting uh, the form and just inputting your data the second person will be uh, specialized in uh, reserving the ticket the third person will be then uh, taking the money from you and the fourth person will be just issuing you the ticket in a parallel way now at the same time three or four people will be in the queue and working into this particular pipeline however all these units are going to do small uh, task they can be specialized task so they will enhance the speed right so they are they are the specialized task so everybody is doing a special task so you will be that particular person will be mastering in that particular task so like that so the, in, uh, the that means in the computers similarly in a pipeline the specialized task can be made more efficient and they then they move very very fast into the units and more instructions can be output at the same point of time uh, and uh, in fact uh, that is uh, one of the pipeline is one of the hallmark of reduce instructions at computer where one instruction per cycle is expected to be produced which is a very good uh, output rate as far as uh, execution of instruction is concerned then uh, this uh, unit also this, uh, i mean this block also deals with the hardwired control as i discussed with you that uh, the micro operation leads to uh, the control unit and micro program control where the concept like uh, 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 that is uh, micro program uh, micro -pro program memory no uh, then uh, how that micro programs or the micro instructions can be utilized uh, by the uh, by the control unit to issue uh, different sets of signals and finally we have discussed about the risk principle where reduce instruction set computer has been designed why they are needed i mean everything in risk is happens to be very very simple and there are strong logic associated with reduce instruction set computer specifically that uh, the in the i mean in uh, designing instruction set we become very very uh, I, i may say very uh, i mean we we become simple uh, complex we become complex uh, in the sense that we try to build, build the complex instructions into the computer now the ref result of that bringing in complex uh, implementing complex instruction is that simpler instruction execute at a uh, at a fast i mean at a slower rate and that is not the essence so what they say that the complex instructions are hardly utilized by programmers right so uh, it may be a better idea to enhance the processing of simpler instructions rather than enhancing the speed of 
complex instruction. So that logic they brought in with the help of uh, what they did, uh, some survey of lots of programs and on that basis they came up with this particular idea. And uh, they came up with that the, since the instruction formats are very, very simple. So uh, the, all the register instructions should be there, the one uh, addressing modes be very, very simple. All this uh, simplicity was brought in. So when they, they brought in simplicity, they, uh, they got a lot of space available in the processor because uh, with the VLSI kind of technology, a lot of complexity was being built into the logic. And that com when the complexity was reduced, so a lot of space was saved. And they utilized it in creating lot many registers. And these registers are beautifully used for, the, uh, for uh, passing uh, control to uh, next subroutines or functions. So that is the kind of discussion which has been done, dealt with in this particular unit. So this uh, like uh, reduce instruction set computer helps in uh, enhancing the, uh, the, your modular design to a great extent. Like one function calling another, there is uh, almost uh, no, uh, uh, no movement is required as far as register transfer is concerned, but there is a moment of register window in risk processor. So good philosophy, interesting philosophy. You will be enjoying it. And these days, remember, the processors are mostly risk processors. So you must go through this particular concept uh, uh, very, uh, I mean, in a great detail. It is a good interesting concept and then finally the risk pipeline which basically deals with that how uh, instructions can be enhanced using the risk processor. Then finally in block 4 we have discussed about the 8086 microprocessor. So 8086 microprocessor structure which has two units I think we have discussed in uh, one of the sessions then the instructions related to 8086 microprocessor, the addressing modes related to 8086 processor, the type of instructions, the need and use of assembly language, why we should be using it. So all these things we have discussed input output in assembly language program with the help of interrupts. It's very very important that how an interrupt can be a software interrupt can be uh, built into the system. So this uh, assembly language program, uh, we use interrupt 21H, not only to exit, but with different functions we can utilize for input and output. If you, are, uh, you don't have microprocessor kit, there the different in and out instructions can be used in that particular kit also. But uh, for the sake of assembly language instruction, it may be a good idea to deal with interrupt 21H with the uh, uh, different functions 01H, uh, NAH and all that. So you will learn, it, uh, uh, learn about these uh, input output stuff from uh, your uh, uh, this uh, block four in uh, this particular thing. Then sample assembly programs are, have been provided. Uh, some of them are using arrays, some of them are doing uh, logical operations, some of the, um, then, them are doing transfer, right? One of the key problem which you will be facing is that first the logical concept you have to overcome is that there is a uh, assembler directives, so and assembler directives and segment registers. So segment registers, why they are there, you need to understand that. Okay, segment registers are required just to convert a 16-bit address to 20-bit address, and they also divide logically uh, memory into certain segments, overlapping segments. But that overlapping segment is not that important for you. But at least understanding that there will be a data segment, there will be a code segment, there will be a stack segment, and and uh, they should not, oh, I mean, they can be overlapping in hardware as far as hardware is concerned, but in, uh, when in our implementation, they should not overlap. For example, stack segment, suppose it overlaps the data segment, then probably they will be overwriting. So they should be separately uh, stored into, into the memory as far as when you design it. And then how those segment registers are initialized. So for that, I think uh, some of the instructions are there in the assembly language programming. And then the logical, in, uh, like uh, logic of assembly language programming. There are certain constraints, as you know, in assembly language programming that in 8086, uh, both the operands cannot be memory. Now, if both the operands cannot be memory and you want to add two memory operands, right, then there is a problem, right? So you need to write longer programs and dealing with that is and other things you can do. Okay, one of the interesting thing about uh, block four is the string matching. In fact, string matching is uh, barely, it's one kind of instruction which is utilized, which is not utilized by the uh, compilers of the instruction. So string matching is a very interesting uh, domain of instruction in 8086 and there are a few programs which are associated over there. Uh, the 
next thing which it talks about is the modular programming. Now modular programming has been propagated to you in the form of structured programming uh, from C, object oriented programming, C++ and all that. So basically you are creating module with whether they are secure or not, that is a separate thing. But then somehow you divide your program into number of objects or number of uh, modules or number of functions. So all these things need to interact, how they are passed on. So obviously there are going to be subroutine calls and subroutine calls and return from those subroutine calls. Now when, when, we are, when there are subroutine calls, what you are moving, you are moving from a program. Suppose there is, it, at one place is your program, then you move to a function which may be at a different memory location and once that function executes, you come back. So that's how the subroutine calls one. So there is a, uh, like which is the next, next instruction to be executed and then what is going to be the return uh, value. So return values are always stored in the stack. Okay, so that is what has been discussed in uh, modular programming. What has been discussed? There can be far, uh, far uh, function calls or uh, subroutine calls or near subroutine calls. Near subroutine calls are within the seg same segment. So you only store the, uh, the offset. Whereas when the assembly language uh, the is, uh, that is the, there is a far assembly call, uh, far uh, call, then, uh, then you require to store the segment as well as uh, the offset of the instruction. So like that, these kinds of information has been dealt with in quite a detail as far as modular programming is concerned. So then uh, interfacing assembly with high level language has been dealt with. Now this really depends on uh, compiler to compiler. So it has been dealt with, I mean it has been talked about in the context of C programmer, but it will be very difficult to implement because uh, nowadays uh, overall uh, C program uh, program structure has changed, uh, the models of C program has changed. So it will be difficult, but this is there just for an idea. Then a very interesting uh, concept like device driver in assembly, how device driver can be, uh, can be designed, like what, what are the steps which are required for a dev device driver has been dealt with. And finally, a very interesting uh, program is there, which is interrupts in assembly. Now interrupt, the difference between an interrupt uh, uh, program and a modular program is very simple. In interrupt program, what you do, you store the context of the machine also, because in uh, when you are doing modular programming, you know where exactly you come back and you know what is to be passed on and what is going to be returned and uh, none, none of the registers are impacted, then, technically speaking. In, and even if they are impacted, that is what you know, they, that has been the design of uh, the situation. But when it comes to interrupts, in interrupts, the uh, what we say the status, the status of the program, the whatever program which is going on, and we don't know which program is going on because interrupt can occur at any point of time of any uh, uh, when, when any program. So we don't know which program we, uh, we are going to come back and uh, there is no specific uh, call and return statement. Just there is an interrupt uh, call to interrupt servicing program, right? So the status of the various register is also stored when you are dealing with uh, interrupt uh, servicing, right? So when you are writing an interrupt servicing program, the, all the re registers which might be affected by the interrupt servicing program need to be stored. Once again, where are they going to be stored? Always onto the stack. There is no other, uh, no, there is no third place where the information is stored. It is always stored onto the stack. And then the information is, uh, I mean, the, the interrupt service program does, uh, deals with all the things, then the return returns to the next instruction, but storing the context, restoring all the registers once again. So that is a very interesting and there is one uh, very good program uh, where uh, you will find how uh, stack, where exactly will be the return address, how the uh, addresses of various registers will, uh, where exactly will be the addresses of various registers, how they will be saved, how they will be uh, restored. So that, that kind of information is there. So you will, uh, I think you will uh, really like that particular example if you know this particular context about it. So this in general is uh, the, overall structure of MCS012, which is a, a course on computer organization and assembly language programming. Uh, there are many activities which you can perform onto this particular course, uh, which deals with the, that studying the block is the most essential, but then you can always uh, learn from external sources and there are 
three references which are given in the in the block you can always refer to those references if you want to learn more then you must solve all the check your progress questions by yourself uh, compare your answers with the whatever has been given in the block okay so then solve uh, different assignment questions you will uh, in the context so basically assignment questions uh, like learning is very interesting domain where uh, you you just don't learn by just studying okay you you also learn i mean you retain maximum of learning if you perform some problem solving also along with it right so that is why we want you to solve uh, these assignment questions uh, which are primarily either analysis type or some some of them may be recall but very few are of the recall type many of them are analysis compare contrast understand and explain basically explaining the things may make you uh, good in uh, particular presentation skills and then uh, there are many uh, problem solving oriented also where we ask you several questions where you uh, solve different problems in your own way uh, which may be slightly different from what is given in the block so th that enhances the that uh, makes the learning permanent you can also uh, do questions from the previous year question papers especially the numerical questions right uh, they will be helping you your understanding and uh, also uh, give emphasis to theory question and try to write your answer and then compare uh, with uh, whatever is given in the block and unit what points you have missed and so on and so forth and you have any problem you can you are always welcome to discuss it with us uh, just one uh, piece of information that uh, assignment carries 25% of the weightage and viva voce is compulsory in the assignments so make sure that you do your assignment yourself because although viva voce counts 20% also uh, weightage only but if somebody fails in viva viva then his assign his or her assignment will be marked at a very very low level so you uh, prepare well you do well in your assignments the last date is very nearby but uh, be thorough with your assignments do uh, i mean after writing uh, the assignments i mean it is always a good practice to uh, re go through it, i mean go through it again and uh, if you need to write it again there is nothing wrong in writing it again if there are too many mistakes right because uh, it always helps if you are writing it again it always help you uh, in that particular sense okay thank you so much and i think i'm signing off from this particular course thanks and bye